Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. My name is Lauren Swartz, and I'm the president and CEO here. We are so pleased that you've joined us here at the World Affairs Council. We have 70 years of experience of connecting Philadelphia to the world through a variety of programs and opportunities, education, and travel. And we're back to in-person programming. As you can see, we've got a group of people in our event space with us downtown and about three times as many people joining us online. So whether you're here with us today in person or joining us virtually, we're happy to have you and excited about our discussion with Ambassador David Hale here today. There are so many critical, critical issues facing the world and it's important to keep talking about them. Sometimes even when it feels exhausting or hard, and also there's uplifting news and opportunities to see how we can solve some of the world's most difficult problems. We've got students in person and online joining us today from different high schools and universities around the region. And we're grateful to be able to participate in training the youth who are leading the world today and tomorrow. The format for today's event is relatively simple. We'll have some opening remarks from our guest speaker, Ambassador David Hale, and then after that, we'll go straight to question and answer. We'll be able to facilitate questions online through your Zoom platform. So at any time during the program, just type in your questions using the Q&A feature on your Zoom. For those of you who are here in, in person with us, we'll have two people with microphones. So just raise your hand and we'll call on you. We do ask you to use the microphone to ask questions, and that allows our audience who's joining us virtually to hear you just as loud and clearly as your colleagues do in this meeting room. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce our honored speaker today, Ambassador David Hale. He's a distinguished diplomatic fellow at the Wilson Center currently, and that is located in Washington, DC. However, Ambassador Hale is a former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He was also the ambassador to Pakistan and the ambassador to Lebanon. And he was a special envoy for Middle East peace and a deputy special envoy and ambassador to Jordan. He served multiple tours in Jordan and Lebanon and served in Tunisia, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and the US mission to the UN. And if that wasn't enough, Ambassador David Hale also served in Washington as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Israel, Egypt, and the Levant, as well as Director for Israel-Palestinian Affairs. You're sensing a trend here. We definitely have a Middle East expert before us today. He also held several staff posts within the US government, including Executive Assistant to Secretary of State Albright. Hale joined the Foreign Service in 1984 and currently holds the rank of career ambassador. He's a recipient of many awards, as you can imagine, including the Distinguished Service Award, the Presidential Rank Award of Meritorious Service, and several department superior and meritorious honor awards. Ambassador Hale speaks Arabic, of course, and he's a graduate of the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and he's a native of our neighboring state, New Jersey. We're happy to have you here in Pennsylvania today, just across the river. Thank you for joining us and for your time today and for your lifetime of service to our government and to help making peace and making strategic decisions all around the world. I'll have Ambassador Hill give opening remarks and I'll sit down next to him. We'll have an informal conversation. And again, when we're ready for Q&A, if you're joining us online, type your questions into the Zoom format and the Q&A platform. Also, if you're here in, in person, just raise your hand and we'll bring our microphone over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you all for coming. I might just speak from the chair here to keep things informal. Uh, and let me start with kind of an admin note. Although I'm on uh, secondment to the Wilson Center, I'm still a Foreign Service officer, still being paid by the State Department. Uh, so I'm obliged to, uh, to uh, toe the line to a certain degree um, and uh, make sure that I don't do anything that's cross-purposes with the current administration. Uh, but by the same token, I'm not speaking on their behalf. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a little bit of a narrow uh, needle to thread, but I'll do my best. Um, I also thank you for mentioning New Jersey. I, my, my mother's family is actually from Philadelphia, and my father's family is from New York. Um, and I grew up in New Jersey on that fault line between subways and hoagies. So uh, I do have a little understanding of the lay of the land here. Uh, it's great to be in Philadelphia. I, um, the letter you sent me said that the topic today was uh, diplomacy as a force for the common good, which was a really interesting theme, uh, which I developed, uh, you know, thought through over the, the, the last few days. 
Um, and I came across on Saturday a Wall Street Journal article that was reviewing a book about Henry Kissinger. And the author of the book said that uh, if you want to do good, then you have no business being in foreign relations, which you know was a cute thing to say and was kind of a dig at Henry Kissinger, I suppose. Uh, but I couldn't disagree more with the, the thesis behind that. Uh, but it does get into the complexity uh, of, of good and bad uh, and, and foreign affairs and diplomacy. And I don't want to drive you all crazy, but you've got to at least start by trying to think through in your own mind the definition of diplomacy and the definition of good as it applies to foreign relations and diplomacy. And, uh, diplomacy. Um, you know, diplomacy is got to be one of the oldest professions, right? It's the conduct of your relations with your neighbors. And um, you obviously want to do your best to have a good neighbor, but if your neighbor is not so good, what are you going to do? Well, diplomacy is uh, the art of persuasion, uh, to try to persuade your neighbors, uh, in the case of the United States, a global country, uh, pretty much everyone on the globe, uh, to find a common course that advances our interests, which we generally define as, as good ones uh, for peace and world order. And I, I, you know, I had a textbook at Georgetown uh, that was called Diplomacy, and the author who was, uh, had been instrumental in World War I in the bringing about the Versailles Peace Treaty, he defined diplomacy really as three functions, that you, you represent your head of state, your country, overseas when you're assigned to another country. Uh, you report on what's going on in that country to your home office so they understand what's going on there and can adjust uh, their policies accordingly. And if you have a reason to do it, you negotiate agreements with a foreign country that help our own interests. Now, that's kind of simplistic. Uh, that may have been the world as it existed in 1919, but a diplomat's job has become far more complex than those three tasks. Uh, again, because the United States has acquired a global power, and I think the walls show the history of that from 1949 when the World Affairs Council was founded to, to today, the world leaders who've come to Philadelphia to talk to you, uh, because what happens in America matters greatly to all of them, and diplomats are one of the channels for interacting between two countries, but only one. And there are many, many diplomats or ambassadors with small d's and small a's interacting every day across borders. And in many ways, those contacts, those relationships, those activities are far more valuable and meaningful over time than in what governments do to each other. Um, again, I'd be happy to elaborate on that or in, in the Q&A. Um, which brings me, of course, to the issue uh, and by the way, I would say that one of the key tasks of a diplomat, one of the key qualities you want in a diplomat is the ability to understand what's going on overseas, which requires a degree of empathy. It doesn't mean agreement. Empathy is not the same thing as, as, uh, as concurrence. But if you don't empathize and put yourself in the shoes of a foreign society or a group of people or a leader of that country, chances are you're going to not be very effective in explaining to your home government what exactly is going on in that country. And the other is candor. You know, and there's, there's an old, uh, old saying, which I really dislike, which is that a diplomat is someone who's sent overseas to lie for his or her country. Um, I think that confuses the role of a spy with the role of a, of a diplomat. We, we, a, a diplomat who lies is a diplomat whose uh, functionality will quickly evaporate when people discover that and, and realize that they're not dealing with someone who has the uh, reliability and sincerity that's needed to have these kinds of conversations that we have. Uh, and candor, to be able to tell a foreign leader with directness, uh, with courtesy and respect, but with directness, what our policies are and what the consequences will be if we have a disagreement, if, if in case that happens. This brings me to the, the question of good. Um, again, I don't want to drive you all crazy with philosophical discussions, but good is a complicated thing, uh, if you think about it, particularly when it comes in a foreign context. Uh, at one level, a diplomat does good for American citizens. That's our core function, is to help American citizens overseas if they get in trouble or if they you know, have a financial dispute or, God forbid, they get into jail. Um, we're there to help them. And um, frankly, the, the two most moments I'm proudest of in the Foreign Service was when I was able to help ordinary Americans uh, in situations of distress. My first assignment, I was a vice consul doing consular affairs, helping Americans, which is often the case with your first assignment. And I was in Saudi Arabia, and um, an American mother uh, and, and a Jordanian husband had been driving, and her, they had had an auto accident, and the Jordanian husband was killed. Uh, and she was left with this little infant. They had no roots in Saudi Arabia. They were on their way traveling there to begin work. Um, and she wanted to go back to her home, to her family in Detroit. 
uh, it wasn't so simple. The Saudi authorities were not automatically going to approve of that because the Jordanian in-laws came, and that cultural environment was such that the, uh, the implicit assumption would be that a child in that situation would go to the parents of the father. Well, you can imagine how stressful the situation developed over time, but over the course of a week, and primarily because there were no Saudi nationals involved, uh, we got the government to say, well, you, if you can work it out with the Jordanian in-laws, then we will, do, we will bless whatever you do. And you know, I negotiated for a week, and I kind of preyed upon the, the emotions of the family and saying, wouldn't it be better for the child, the baby, to be with a mother? And over time, we, we got to the right place, and, and she was able to, to fly home with, with her, her child. Um, and at the end of my career as ambassador to, uh, near the end, as ambassador to Pakistan, uh, we stumbled across the fact that there was a whole American family that were, was being held hostage by Taliban associates in Pakistan. The Pakistani government had been assuring us that was not the case. Uh, the evidence showed otherwise. And I had to make a snap decision that moment, were we going, how we were going to handle this. It was the middle of the night in Washington, and uh, the evidence was fleeting. So I, I went to the guy who runs the country, the head of the army, and we... we you know, I confronted him with this and said, you, you have a choice. It's really one choice to, to, you know, to bring these people into safety. Um, and they did. Um, and again, it was very gratifying because she had several children. They'd been in captivity for years. She'd given birth in captivity. The real negotiations, the hard part, was with her husband, who was a Canadian, who had um, uh, takfiri tendencies. Uh, and that's what got them into trouble in the first place. And he didn't want to get in, onto an American aircraft because uh, he was afraid what we might do to them, which was not valid, but that was, that was the angle he had. So we had to work all of that out with the Canadians. And again, it was most, one of the most satisfying moments of doing good, the starting point of this conversation for, for, for normal people in distress. Um, but my guess is you had something else in mind on the subject, uh, which is how, at a, at a bigger scale, at a strategic scale, uh, do we, in fact, uh, promote good. Um, and for America... Time and time again, since at least the beginnings of these these photos, history of photos, or photos of history, um, is building a world order. Um, that has been the foundation, uh, the uh, structure for us to do the best we can. Uh, we've not always gotten it right uh, by far, and in the Q and A, we can maybe tease out some of those those decisions that were made. Uh, but for the United States, building the best possible world order, uh, based on international law and norms, uh, uh, free market economy universal values of human rights. Uh, that has been the project of the United States. And I think the legacy is something that we should all be very proud of, but can never stop working on. Uh, we ourselves that sometimes uh, fall short of those ideals, and certainly others do as well. Um, but it's that framework that allows us to build a coalition of others to join us in that effort um, to try to make the best of very difficult situations overseas. The sources of our power and why we're able to play such an instrumental role in building world order is not our diplomacy. That's a tool. It's our military strength. It's our economic strength, which is global in extent and not controlled by our government. It is the power of, of the capital of free market. Um, and our values, uh, which time and time again uh, comes up, <clears throat> even in uh, administrations you might not think, uh, our, the promotion of our values in one way or the other is a powerful dimension of our foreign policy and is a powerful attraction uh, for people uh, who may not be, who share those values but may not be able to enjoy them in their own societies and they yearn for help from us in that regard. I will um, I'll also comment though in that connection that trying to delink de any of those three and particularly delinking diplomacy from the potential use of military power doesn't really work very well for us. And I, you know, I'm writing a book right now on American policy toward Lebanon. I spent many, many years there, and it's a historical account. And in 1958, we sent 15,000 Marines to Lebanon because we were afraid of an Arab nationalist communist takeover of a pro-Western country. Uh, a day after the 15,000 Marines landed, we sent one diplomat, uh, one of my predecessors as Under Secretary of State. He did all the work. The Marines never were, were in a situation where they had to use force. Uh, but 15,000 soldiers is a lot of credibility behind you if you're a diplomat. And that forced attention on what it is we wanted to see them do. Uh, we also had to reassure them we weren't there to occupy the country. We would leave as soon as a political solution was found. And we found a political solution that was one that was attractive to all of the different sects, which are many in Lebanon, to get out of there. And the Marines were gone within 100 days, one dead uh, as a result of a sniper. But a uh, remarkable story. I don't think we could do that today. 
uh, that was more innocent times. But the point I'm trying to make is that the military implicitly or even explicitly has got to be in the background anytime the US diplomacy is doing something hard uh, in a geostrategic environment. And sometimes diplomacy can stop a war, sometimes it can avert a war, uh, sometimes it can only pick up the pieces after war. And I'm thinking of the Falklands, for example. Uh, you know, we, we tried really hard <clears throat> to stop uh, the Brits from having to do what they had to do to recover the Falklands Islands. Margaret Thatcher was steaming away with her, you know, her vessels are on their way for the long, long uh, journey from uh, Portsmouth to the Falklands. U.S. diplomacy activated because we didn't want to see this happen between two friends. And uh, Al Haig went on this shuttle flight back and forth, back and forth. And he kept getting lied to by Galtieri, the Argentine dictator, because they would agree in a meeting. And then when they got on the plane to go back to London and Haig thought he had something in his hand to avert this war, he got a phone call from Buenos Aires and said, oh, by the way, the president actually meant this. He didn't mean that. We'll start all over again. It was a delaying tactic uh, meant to get us to try to slow down the Brits. Galtieri couldn't possibly compromise. He would lose his position in, in, as head of the, of the country there if he compromised. And we eventually had realized that and backed off. And it was only after the aftermath where we tried to do things that helped make things better uh, between Argentina and, uh, and the UK. Uh, so there are real limits. And I'm thinking of that now today also with Ukraine and Crimea and Russia. And we can talk about that in the Q&A as well. Uh, you know, we tried we the diplomacy we could uh, before the, the, the Russians invaded Ukra uh, Crimea. But I'm absolutely confident that there was no diplomacy conceivable that would have stopped uh, the Russian authorities from doing what they wanted to do because we don't have a collective self-defense agreement with Ukraine. We don't have an obligation to come to their defense. Uh, we may have an interest in doing that and, and no one wants to take options off the table, but everyone knows they're not part of NATO and everyone knows because we're an open society what our society debates and what it tolerates in terms of the deployment of U.S. troops and whether deploying American soldiers in Ukraine to, to defend Crimea is something the American public would support is a debate that any American administration would have to have. And I think I think we could probably recognize the conclusion we would come to in, in that particular instance. Uh, so we're facing that again today. I don't know what Putin's motivations are, but it's hard to, to keep 100,000 troops on standby just as a threat. Uh, so that's an area where we really need, need to focus as well. Um, I think we should turn to Q&A pretty soon because that's going to be much more interesting. Uh, but building bridges, which is where the world affairs uh, comes in as well, of understanding between societies is a crucial part of promoting good and of diplomacy. And we have, since 9-11, really uh, fundamentally revolutionized the way the US government uh, promotes better understanding. We've got tremendous resources to do it. We've focused on Islamic societies, perhaps overly so, not to do that, but that's where it seemed to be the urgent need was required. Um, and it's not just about um, you know student exchanges and uh, lectures uh, and those kinds of things, important as they are in building better good bridges of understanding, but also demonstrating to people how America is a force for good. Um, and I remember when I was ambassador in, uh, in Jordan, our, our uh, polling data was very low for the United States, although we had been a generous contributor to their economy and the, their government for, for years and years. People didn't really value that so much. 60% uh, of the country are Palestinians by origin. So what they looked at was the American-Israeli relationship, and they drew at the conclusions they wanted to draw from that. The one time we saw our polling data spike up was when Condoleezza Rice intervened. She put aside all of her work to intervene to bring about peace in Gaza, which was erupting. This is probably 2006, maybe, which was erupting a terrible, terrible tragedy. Um, and she brought about a ceasefire agreement, and our, and our, uh, our data went way up. So when I always talk to our people who are trying to craft strategies for public diplomacy, we call it, how do you build a better understanding? <clears throat> it, is, it can't be divorced from reality or from facts or from the things we're doing. You can't market something. It has to be authentic. And it has to be grounded in a policy that people accept, understand, and appreciate. And then we need to help them understand that and see that. Of course, that, that's our role. And to bring expose people who may not otherwise be exposed to America and American values. Um, I would, um, I would also just, you know, add one last thing, which is that um, we always have to bear in mind uh, the law of unintended consequences. We may think we're doing something that's good, and we may, in fact, by our own measurement, be doing something that's good, but it can lead to consequences that may be very bad. Um, I think you all know, to, I'm 
Vietnam is a classic example. Maybe you can use Afghanistan as such an example. I don't know. Time will tell. Um, where we, we contributed to situations that led to things that didn't turn out so well, not just for us, but for the people involved. And this more and more is beginning to affect thinking in foreign policy decision making, sanctions policy being key among them. Um, when we don't want to go to war, but our diplomacy is not working, we often turn to punitive actions like sanctions. Well, this is the way we can actually get it, you know, get across uh, that we're serious as to sanction a country. Well, the human price of sanctions can be very enormous. And I, I was in office when uh, the coup occurred in Myanmar, the, the, this, this, the latest coup. And Aung San Suu Kyi was arrested and so forth. And we had this debate about sanctions. And interestingly enough, there, most people agreed that we could not sanction the entire country. It would only make matters far worse. The problem was that the people making the decisions were so insulated from the impact of any American sanctions that it was hard for us to develop a package that actually changed their behavior. Or they'd already, as we say, baked into, they had already calculated whatever costs there were to their decision making and the price was, it was better for them to do what they were doing in their own lights than to, uh, than to respond to our, what we were requesting. We tried to work with the Japanese who have a higher economic interest uh, in, in Myanmar than we do, but uh, we were not able to, to develop a package there. Um, and then I would end, because I've gotten the, uh, I've gotten a hairy eyeball that it's time to stop talking and start listening, but, um, is that uh, the freedom agenda of the Bush 43 administration, again, admirable, uh, truly desire to make that match between good and what our interests are, the sort of enlightened self-interest. Unfortunately, we found when there were free elections, there were organizations that were elected that were not only anti-American, but were anti-democratic in the Middle East. And we can elaborate on that if there's interest in the Q&A. So thank you. Thanks, David. We can open up the floor to questions. We've covered uh, the whole world <laughs> and the history of diplomacy and the force for good and evil in about 20 minutes, so quite impressive. I see David David's hand up first. Good morning. Good morning, Ambassador Hale. Marhaba. Uh, my name is David Miron. I'm also a, a graduate of School of Foreign Service and uh, entered uh, as a Foreign Service officer in 1999 and recently uh, retired, yeah. but I'm still doing some uh, REA work at this point. Great. So I'm curious, uh, particularly to focus on Iran for a moment, uh, if you were back as P, uh, Undersecretary for uh, Political and, or uh, Assistant Secretary back in NEA, New Eastern Affairs, what would you be uh, advising to Secretary Blinken as far as how to approach Iran, uh, get them back at the table, get them to do what we want them to do, and would you consider linking their uh, support for uh, terrorist activities, let's say in particular Hezbollah, and put that on the table as well. So thank you. Yeah. Well, I, we're on the record. I don't know if anyone on the media is going to pay attention, but as I said, I'm, I'm not in a position to dissent from this administration in any way, and I'm not suggesting I would want to. But uh, I'll, I'll answer your question more as a, if anyone wanted my advice, uh, what would I offer? And this is probably one of the more complex foreign policy conundrums that we face right now is, is, is Iran. Um, one of the fundamental questions is the one you addressed of linkage. Um, I think, and again, thinking about the remarks today, this morning, I was, you know, I was going to mention arms control as an area where diplomacy contributed to, I think, a pretty unalloyed good. Not perfection, but good. Uh, we accepted the reality that we were, while we were negotiating arms limitations and reductions with the Soviets, they were, in the meantime, ruining our day or trying to in any number of other places around the world. Uh, and yet we, we lived with that dichotomy because we felt that getting an arms agreement was more, more valuable. And if we tried to link everything, we would end up with nothing. I think that's the dilemma that this administration faces as well. The problem, one of the problems is that uh, in the Middle East, uh, the linkages exist, whether you like them or not. People see them. And I was, when I was last in Lebanon, uh, <clears throat> it was one of my last trips as undersecretary that the new team was in, and I, you know, I had to explain that don't wait for us on Iran. Because the tendency there in a country like Lebanon is that well, they think that an American-Iranian uh, deal is going to change the power equation in their country between the factions aligned with the West and aligned with Iran. Uh, or the absence of a deal will have an effect as well. So there is a tendency to just freeze up and not do anything. And yet the country is in enormous distress. And all kinds of things have to happen there that aren't happening. So one of my messages do not wait for us, uh, which is in essence trying to convince them to delink what in fact is already linked in reality. These are some of the problems that we face. Um, the other issue is that if, you know, 
taking it away from this topic, if I can, is that any foreign negotiating counterpart was somewhat hostile and adversary. Uh, if you demonstrate that you have an ardent desire for a certain outcome, you've just raised the price enormously, obviously. I mean, if you're, if you're trying to buy a house and you tell the owner, I will buy, the seller, I will buy your house on December 31, no matter what. But meanwhile, let's see if we can negotiate a better price. Well, diplomacy really isn't any different than that. So it, it's very important. Uh, we have the added ability to imply that there are going to be consequences if there's no agreement to say that if you don't agree, then the United States will do X, Y, Z, or you have to at least imagine that we will. I think at this point, it might be wise to back off a bit uh, and see what more quiet diplomacy through third parties can achieve without the big lights in Vienna and all of the pressures that come with that. That's for the signing ceremony. Uh, in the meantime, I think there has to be a recalculus on the Iranian part of what's at stake. And the Russians and the Chinese may be more effective, frankly, at doing that, if they're so inclined uh, than we are. Which comes back to the regional linkage. We all agree, the, the, the parties to JCPOA all agree on the nuclear bomb. There is no consensus on uh, Iranian behavior in the region. The Russians and the Chinese would not come along with us in a punitive strategy related to that. So again, uh, coming up with the imperfect, the less good, but not the bad option. And I think that's the course I would advise at this stage from what I see in the newspaper. Additional questions? Art? Hi, I'm Art Friedman, a long-term member of the World Affairs Council. David took one of my two questions. Uh, anyway, this. I guess Biden is um, going into this 100-country conference on democracy. I just wonder where you think that might be going. Well, this is where I spoke of our values and the power of our values uh, and that they're universal, uh, or should be anyway. Uh, we regard them as such. I think most people do. And the Conference of Democracy is an effort to reestablish um, the significant role of that in a strand of our foreign relations. It's interesting looking at the list. I mean, they're not all perfect democracies. Um, there have been trade-offs that have been made, uh, which is, again, part of the theme I was trying to make earlier, which is that there is a perfect good that you know Plato may define, but in the real world, we, we have to make trade-offs, and, and, uh, and, that, and that's involved in this. Um, but it's also, I think, a hope that those who are excluded, uh, you know, some of them won't care. Some of them simply don't have the morality that it matters in the least to them to be excluded. Uh, but others are in between, and it hurts. Uh, and there is, the societies are open enough now. I mean, one of the changes from that the guy I talked about in 1919 to today is social media. There are no secrets anymore. Unless you're in North Korea, uh, you can't really uh, uh, keep everything quiet. So there are people going to say, well, why weren't we, you know, this is one more reason where we're an outcast because we're not excluded. So these events have a symbolic value, I think, in, in highlighting will it change, you know, the world the next day? Uh, no, it won't. But it's a, it's a process uh, that brings a community together. We've got a student in the back, a student from the Bodine High School for International Affairs. Hi, my name is Dahlia. Um, I'm a junior at Bodine High School. And uh, you spoke a lot today about uh, some of the work that you've done internationally. And I also did some research before I came. And I came across um, a meeting that you had in 2009 with Dr. Saeed Irkat. Um, to discuss the Israeli and U.S. proposals for the relaunch of negotiations in Palestine. Uh, in this meeting, you assured Dr. Saeed Irakat that the Obama administration will be committed to tackling the issue of Palestinians having no say in a discussion regarding their land despite meeting all their obligations. Uh, prior to this meeting, you had uh, spent eight months with the Israelis on account that you would be reaching an agreement for negotiation. When Dr. Saeed Irakat asked you about this, you told him, um, I quote, we have not reached an agreement yet, so there is nothing I can tell you. It has been 12 years since that meeting. 1,180 Palestinian children have died as a cause of the Israeli settler presence and the Israeli military since that year. Is there anything that you can tell us now? Um, well, there, there are many things that we wish we could have accomplished uh, as diplomats, as individuals, whatever role in society or international affairs, and sometimes you just don't succeed. Um, and I spent, uh, I spent four years, uh, first with George Mitchell, who was the special envoy, and then he left because things weren't working out, and then I took on the role for the following two years. Um, President Obama was very sincerely committed to doing what he could uh, to bring about peace between uh, the Israelis and Palestinians. Uh, it just didn't work out. 
Um, we can go into all the different reasons uh, why. Uh, I think there's a lot of fault that can be uh, laid to a lot of different feet, uh, but it didn't it didn't work out. And there was a subsequent effort when John Kerry came into office. I left that position to go be ambassador to Beirut to Lebanon. John Kerry came in and he was very passionate about trying to uh, to bring justice uh, and peace uh, there. Uh, and he, he threw himself into it, an enormous amount of energy and effort, and he too was unable to overcome the differences. Um, so we just have not been able to find the key uh, that unlocks this, this tragedy and, and brings about peace that we want. Uh, there have been many different ways, to, uh, def many different methods tried. Uh, the direct involvement of an American president that you saw with, say, President Clinton, uh, you, the uh, 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 use of Security Council resolutions at times, um, uh, secret diplomacy, the Oslo Channel, which uh, brought a great breakthrough, actually, in, in 1993. Um, it hasn't worked. Uh, what we've been able to accomplish is some element of stability and partnership with at least one element of the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah, uh, but that is, that is only a partial and, and uh, incomplete uh, you know, uh, product that, that we've achieved. Um, there is security cooperation between the Israelis and Palestinians, which does bring a measure, some measure of, of, uh, of stability to the lives of Palestinians, but it's a far cry from what we all want to see happen. Um, I think one of the things that I found most troubling during my time working on this, and of course when you're not just working on it, but I spent many, many years in the countries bordering uh, Israel and Palestine, so it's powerfully felt there in those societies, is the dehumanization that has occurred uh, over time, um, and that Palestinians and Israelis really no longer interact much. And uh, Palestinians don't have employment anymore. This is, this is a response by the Israelis to the Intifada and, and all of that, and I don't want to get into a, a blame categorizing issue, but it, one of the very troubling consequences is that dehumanization and, uh, and the way people think once they don't think of the other as a person. Uh, with the same rights and the same needs and the same human responses as they themselves. Um, so we have a lot of work still to do, unfortunately. But thank you for raising the question. It's a vital one. We've got a question from online, which I'll switch to that, and then we can move back to the room. Charles asks, how does the world perceive the political will of the U.S. in using all of its tools in diplomatic Well, I, I go back to the point I made about uh, Condoleezza Rice in Gaza, is that people judge us, they listen to our words, but they judge us from our actions and what are we actually doing. And they, sometimes they see a, a, uh, a contradiction between those. Um, an example from the book I'm writing, in the 1990s in Lebanon, we adhered rhetorically to a position that we in the international community, whatever that is, had stuck to, which is we believed in Lebanese sovereignty and territorial integrity and its independence despite the fact that there were 40,000 Syrian troops occupying uh, much of the country and another 10,000 Israeli troops occupying South Lebanon. Privately, in fact, what we were doing was trying to negotiate a peace agreement between Syria and Israel. And we really wanted, if you look at the memoirs of the people involved, they didn't want Syria to withdraw from Lebanon at that point because they expected that we would need Syrian troops to disarm Hezbollah, which was throwing rockets into Israel, which is the reason the Israelis had their troops in Lebanon. So There's a very complicated uh, sort of uh, train of logic, but it led us to this really, uh, I think, um, blatant contradiction between our rhetoric and our values on the one hand and what we're actually doing, although it was in a sense a, for a common good because we thought the road to stability and peace in Lebanon laid through Damascus. If we could get them to bring about peace, maybe things would get better. Fortunately, eight years of that didn't do anything except consolidate Syrian control over, over Lebanon. Um, and so that was, again, one of those things where we think we're doing something that's good and self-interested, enlightened self-interest. Uh, in fact, the outcome was detrimental to the interests of the Lebanese, first and foremost, ourselves and our partners in the region. Um, political will, though, is a tricky question because it often gets linked up to credibility, question of credibility. And I've seen so often in my career, and again in the research I've been doing on this book, where American leaders get really, really caught up in their credibility. And they will keep doing something. Uh, what's that law where you know keep banging your head against, what is that? You bang your head against the wall, nothing happens. Yeah. 
while seeing that there are no results, they'll still keep doing something, like sending soldiers into Vietnam year after year, because they're so afraid of the consequences for America's so-called credibility of a withdrawal uh, that they can't contemplate that, even though their strategy really no longer makes any sense. And then we found when we did ultimately have to leave, we only made it worse by delaying that day, um, and we survived. Our credibility was still intact. It suffered that year, the next year maybe, but uh, over time, by doing smarter things, uh, by getting relationships right, uh, I think we were able to regain our credibility through our actions. And the, the worst thing in terms of your political will and your credibility, is, in my view, is that gap of candor between what we're saying and what we're doing. It, it often, I think, trips us up in ways that, uh, that really are both avoidable and dangerous for us. Another way to think about it is doing the right things right or the right things wrong or sometimes doing the wrong things right. There you go. Continuing to do it. Uh, Larry, you had your hand up. Lawrence Goldberg. I'm a member of the World Affairs Council. Um, I wanted to ask about your perception of uh, what happens in conflict zones. Maybe Lebanon is a prime example where you have warring factions, religious, political, ethnic, whatever. And invariably, the diplomats come in and they try to engineer a power sharing arrangement or a so-called binational multi-ethnic state. It seems to me that those, fall, those things fall apart invariably like 90% of the time. Do you feel that's a viable approach, and can you think of uh, instances in the world where power sharing and binational states have actually worked well? Um, it's hard to. I think implicit in your question is skepticism about that, and I would, uh, if that's the case, I would share that skepticism. Um, in Lebanon in 1958, this one diplomat for the, the 15,000 Marines, he didn't change the power sharing formula. He re, it, sort of uh, refreshed it. <laughs> He was able to overcome an obstacle, an individual that was a personality more than a systematic thing. But what happened, you know, uh, and everyone was happy to go back to, all the elites were happy to go back to the power sharing formula once they'd gotten rid of the president. But the flaw in that was no one addressed the fundamental reforms. And you can trace a line from that moment till the outbreak of the Lebanese Civil War in 1975 because uh, the, the power sharing formula was, was broken. It was based on dem demographics that were changing, and it excluded the Shia population pretty much from anything but the, the form of power, no real power. And that was just a ticking time bomb as well. But no one wanted America to address it. No one asked us to address it. We didn't address it. Um, in 1976, we got more involved. But again, the decision was made. I mean, Jumblat, others, if you've been to Lebanon, you know that the sort of nationalist leftist wing wanted our help against the Maronites, uh, but we thought about it and we said, no, we're not going to get involved. Uh, was that the right decision? Probably was the right decision to make. But again, no external force was able to compel them to do what they should be doing on their own, and they were certainly unwilling to do it. What everyone else was doing was meddling and fighting out their own regional conflicts with factions inside Lebanon that were aligned with them, and it just made things worse and worse. Uh, you know, and the state building enterprises that we we've adopted. It's not just about power sharing formulas, but also trying to take over the reins of governance long enough to somehow make it all work. And then we think when we go away, it's going to last. And it hasn't. Um, I was ambassador of Pakistan. And you know, there we, you might remember Kerry Luger Berman, $1.5 billion a year for I don't know how many years in foreign assistance. It's a sizable amount of money. Um, and the premise was, you can't defeat extremism with a gun. You got to, you got to, defeat its sources. And what are its sources? Well, we don't know, but maybe it's poor or absent governance. Now, we didn't have any empirical data one way or the other, but that was the kind of the starting point in Washington. So let's, let's do what we can to develop these societies in these marginal areas. The problem with that was, you know, I, went, I remember I came at the end of this thing, but uh, I flew down to see one of the projects. It was a waste, it was a water project for this big agricultural town. Beautiful thing. I mean, they've had drinking water and a, and a wastewater system they've never, ever had could change people's lives. The problem with it was that it wasn't linked to any other changes going on there. So I remember going out to look at the wastewater thing, and it was in the middle of a field with a farmer who had a flush toilet, perhaps, but he was still plowing his field with a plow that could have been used in the year 600. I mean, it was this wooden thing. We hadn't changed the economy, the ways of governance, the ways of education. We hadn't linked all those things up together. And it's not our job. This is one of the reasons we, we didn't have the resources, the money, capability to do that. It required a Pakistani buy-in that for a lot of different reasons, and I'm not trying to fault anybody, but for a lot of reasons, the capacity just wasn't there to do that. And so, I no, I firmly agree with you. Uh, we can help resolve conflicts. 
but we cannot rebuild a society um, uh, to avoid conflict. It has to come from within. We've got a question here that dovetails a bit into this about uh, business, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about America's force in the world, military, diplomacy, economy, from the private sector's perspective, and, and as a career ambassador, what do you see as the best ways for the private, American private sector to interact with the diplomatic sector to create opportunities for business, but also to help support the work of our diplomatic corps? Yeah. Well, um, you know, the State Department is notorious for not having much of a constituency in the United States, and we could spend time, it's probably not that useful right now, on why that is. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, you know, most Americans don't encounter in a direct, meaningful way what it is we provide. It's such a long-term thing in terms of building relationships. But American business hopefully does appreciate that. Those that are involved overseas, although a surprisingly few number of them are. Um, uh, and uh, it would be great if they told the story of how uh, an American embassy may have made a difference for them. Uh, a lot of them don't think American embassies, by the way, are all that effective. Uh, but I found, uh, you know, with a big Fortune 500 company, they don't need a commercial officer at an embassy to tell them how to register. You know, they, they know that. They don't need us to set up a partnership with a uh, counterpart. Uh, they know how to do that. What an American ambassador can do is make sure that the head of state or the head of government or the key decision makers for an American, for a contract Americans want for access to that market uh, know that this is a priority not just for that company, but it is for me, and it is for my president, and we're going to keep at it, and this is why it's good for you, um, and, and why you should make the right choices uh, when there's a foreign, uh, when there's competition underway. That's, what, that's a place where we can really make a difference. Um, and also helping them to understand how to manage risk. We have a great uh, network called the Overseas Security Advisory uh, Committee, which brings our, our security experts at our embassy who have become really phenomenal. I mean, they're the best in the world right now, by the way, uh, in terms of global security. And, uh, and help corporate counterparts uh, in that capital or wherever it is understand what we see in terms of the threats and how to mitigate it and give them advice on that. And so it goes well beyond just the normal thing where we alert Americans, oh, there's been a coup, you know, watch out. Uh, but really day-to-day -day partnership with corporations um, so that they have a, as good an understanding of, of the security environment as possible. And I think that's, that's been a great tool. And that, of course, taps into the full, all the toolkit of an American embassy uh, in terms of our, our, our information, our understanding of society, and then having the advocacy of an ambassador, particularly if there's a security problem. Um, I don't know if I answered your question adequately, but. Yeah, I, I think I got it first. They'll, they'll chime back in on the Q&A. OK. All right, I see Montana in the back. Hello, my name is Montana. I'm currently a graduate student pursuing my Master of Public Administration at Penn, as well as a very recent intern here at the World Affairs Council. So you mentioned in your talk that at times the US government supports leaders who promote Western values and then upon assuming office, they don't necessarily follow through with that. So thinking about the current conflict in Ethiopia, given US and other Western governments support for Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's transition into power, what can and should the U.S. government's role be between the government and the TPLF at this point? Yeah, uh, that was one of the uh, great disappointments, I think, of the last uh, two years in terms of, of Africa. There had been such hope about him. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in the initial conversations, there was a tendency in, in Addis Ababa to blame, try to shift blame around. You know, it's not me, it's somebody else, it's the military. It's, you, you gotta take responsibility, which was a big missing part initially, um, what was happening. And uh, the other conundrum we have here is, is uh, talking about values is that, you know, I don't know if you can do an opinion poll in Ethiopia right now about what's happening because of the violence, but it's not black and white for, for everybody living there, uh, sad to say. Um, and these are ancient disputes and feuds, a lot of, built up vengeance. And, um, and so it's, it's really, really a complicated situation. It's spilling over, which I think is where you know, we in particular can play a role is trying to do what we can to contain the spill out effect. I think that that's a legitimate, uh, African states accept that, uh, the UN accepts it, we all have rules that govern that. Um, it's destabilizing Sudan, South Sudan. Uh, then you've got the Eritrean role in all of this. 
a uh, very complicated set of issues. I think you know appointing an envoy was a was a good move uh, to give it full time attention, uh, but um, the leadership seems pretty much uh, impervious to external influence, and that creates an environment which is very hard to get our way. Uh, what we could probably best do over time is provide an alternative course for dispute resolution. But that's not going to happen until uh, one or both sides feel that they've exhausted their options. Uh, one of the things, again, I'm preparing for today and thinking about when diplomacy can, uh, can deal with conflict, um, it's often a case in which the parties exhaust themselves. And uh, uh, I saw this in Israel and, and Lebanon in 2006. The Israelis, remember that ter terrible war, the Israelis, they were bombing everything in Lebanon. They were just bombing and bombing and bombing. Because they didn't know how to get how to stop it, they didn't have a goal that they could define that would bring them into it. So Condoleezza Rice had to define the goal for them, and then we took it to the UN and we had a big negotiation in Ottawa. But that's what it took. The two, neither side, both sides, realized that violence was no longer going to get them what they wanted, if it ever was in the first place. It was time now somebody had to help them climb out of the situation they're in, and maybe that's that's the best hope with Avi. I don't know that sanctions. Would be that effective again if he? I, I don't know him. I, if he's a leader who is an, impervious to that, I don't know. He certainly cared a lot about his reputation at one point. That doesn't seem to matter so much today, does it? All right. Well, Montana asked you about Ethiopia, and Jeffrey is online asking you about Afghanistan. You can imagine both of these would come up today. Uh, Jeffrey asks, as for the Taliban's handling of Afghanistan. Would you advise the Biden administration to take a tough and unyielding line on matters like repatriation of money, or should we soften our position to avert a colossal humanitarian tragedy? Yeah, this is a classic dilemma uh, that we face uh, as a country, we, and we bear responsibility uh, because we have been there for all these years as well. Um, I have to confess, and I don't think it's an easy decision by any part, and I can, I can understand the arguments on both sides, I would take a harder line. Uh, not perhaps uh, a, a, uh, a line that is so hard that it can't be, you know, have some assistance going uh, so that we limit the, the humanitarian effect of what's happened. But people need to understand uh, the trade-offs. And if the Taliban, you know, we can offer a package of incentives and disincentives. We can explain what certain behavior patterns on their part can, un can do in terms of unlocking international humanitarian relief and other forms of relief. Um, but we need to put, at the extent possible, the burden on the Taliban leadership to demonstrate that they're, uh, that they're taking actions and behaving in a fashion which allows us to, behave, to act. Uh, we certainly don't want to see humanitarian assistance uh, make it easier for the Taliban to do the outrageous things that they're doing in terms of uh, the role of women in their societies, uh, the role of education, um, all of those things. Uh, so uh, short-term firmness may be, and toughness may be better in the long term in terms of the humanitarian situation, but we won't know that. The other thing I would urge is to not just sort of ramp up the pressure and then walk away. It needs constant monitoring. Uh, what are the op opportunities we have to have a coalition of others uh, who are also looking, you know, we may not be able to talk to the Taliban, but there sure are others who, who are. Pakistan plays a key role here um, and working with all of them so we can get to a point where we don't have to have that, uh, that uh, tough, tough line. Mm -hmm. <coughs> a question in the back? So my name is Leona. I'm an international relations student from Germany, and I um, wanted to touch on the Russia, Ukraine, and NATO situation. And I would like to ask your opinion. Um, do you think this conflict is like is um, is it possible to resolve that conflict by mainly demo uh, diplomatic actions, or do you think it's already too far gone in that sense that there's already military posturing going on on both sides and all the actions Russia has already taken or the force? Yeah. Well, I would advocate for diplomacy, no surprise there. Um, but right and right through, I mean, no matter what happens, we should never stop uh, talking. Um, I mean, uh, James Baker was trying to talk to Tariq Aziz right the days before the uh, invasion of Kuwait occurred. Um, I remember because I was in Jordan and we were trying to figure out how to get his Cadillac to Baghdad, you know. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we just keep doing it. I, you know, I think we have to be realistic as well, um, and we have to try to understand what Moscow's motives are. What is it they're trying to accomplish? Is this just uh, uh, just hard hard negotiating on their part to, to use the leverage of their soldiers to try to gain concessions from the Ukrainian government? 
they want to use uh, this constant uh, uh, threaten, threat, threats and, and fear to weaken that regime so that over time it can kind of just no longer be able to withstand uh, Russians. Uh, or do they in fact want to invade and you know, they have a date in mind? I don't know. I don't know the answers to that. Um, but uh, I, my guess is the Ukrainian leadership and Zelensky in particular are thinking hard through all of those things. So it's not just the United States and NATO that's acting. Principally, first and foremost, is what is what is Putin going to do? And then what is Zelensky's response going to be to try to prevent or ameliorate that and what's happening? So I hope we're coordinating very close to Zelensky to make sure we're able to give him as strong a position as possible. Uh, but then at the end of the day, uh, you know, this is an area where there, there's going to be a limit in terms of any kind of, of physical response uh, by the alliance. Again, I don't think anyone wants to take issue, uh, uh, options off a table, but that's, that's, that would be a very, very dramatic move. Um, I would say that uh, you know, one of the things we've hoped for in imposing sanctions on the Russian system and the oligarchic system is that while it may not stop the behavior that just happened that led to us to, to impose the sanction, Hopefully, it'll make them think twice before they do the, you know, the next time. Uh, I, this will be an interesting example to, to inform us in the future. And I also, you know, if I was a German uh, consumer, I'd be wondering about my energy supplies uh, in future winters and wondering why dependence on, on Russia was such a smart thing to do. Um, so, not my decision, yours. But <laughs> <laughs> Peter? Hello, David. Thank you for coming today. Thanks. Uh, quick question. I know you spent some time in Haiti, and uh, that's another country that faces many, many problems. Just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that. Yeah, and I know you've spent, uh, Peter and I were classmates at Georgetown, by the way. So, uh, but you know, you spent a lot of time on Haiti as well. Uh, one of the things people I sometimes I think forget now is that how close Haiti is to us. Uh, and how instability in Haiti spillover in the United States is not some sort of imaginary thing. It happens all the time. There's also a Haitian community in the United States, in Florida and elsewhere, that cares passionately about what's happening in Haiti. And we have an obligation uh, as a government to, to be mindful of that and pay attention to what they see and what they need. Um, uh, you know, the president's assassin, he was a pain in the neck, I have to say. I met him a number of times, and he just he just wasn't willing to make the compromises needed to get the constitutional process, the political process going. I don't know why he was assassinated. There's a lot of talk about criminal behavior and narcotics behavior. Uh, what I do know is that there's a profound, seems to me anyway, as a, an outsider, I'm no expert in Haiti, a profound lack of leadership um, that, uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, people's, the divisions in that society are really, really strong. People do not want to compromise. Um, and in particular, uh, those who are on the right, believe they're on the right side of human rights and democracy, do not want to compromise on those values. Um, uh, and on the other side, there are those who simply are un unwilling to, to give up the control that they've got. Uh, I would say that the United States could do a lot more in Haiti than it's doing. And um, I think we need to uh, consider, if not an envoy, at least a more dedicated team that's looking at Haiti on a full-time basis um, you know, a lot of Latin America needs our attention, uh, but Haiti, Haiti is, as I said, right there. And if things go wrong, it can not only be a terrible tragedy for the Haitian people, but we will feel it in our country very soon. Um, but again, it goes back to the question your, your neighbor asked. Is that the United States can't tinker with its screwdriver and come up with a political solution. It can be a convener. Uh, we can bring people that don't otherwise meet into the ambassador's house, and we do that to talk. Uh, but we, it's very hard for us to come up with the solutions. We can use pressure tactics. That does matter in a place like Haiti. The, the, their linkage is, their, their, their oxygen is through Miami. And so travel restrictions on recalcitrant people can matter. They want to be able to have their kids go to college in the U.S., that kind of thing. So we do have leverage points, which we should be using. And I, I, I would, if I would, was asked by this administration, I would consider ways to step up our game. Uh, that's all. We have a question online that um, asks you about China. We've been around the world, but not to China <laughs> yet. So with a few minutes left, um, Charles asks, can you discuss China's Belt and Road Initiative and what the U.S. should do about it? Yeah, you know, when I went to Pakistan, I was sent out um, by the Obama administration in its last year. And I, I went and I asked the, the leadership, well, what's our position on Belt and Road? Because Pakistan's a big, big part of that. And I said, you know, my instinct is, 
to not be against it. Uh, because first of all, the Pakistanis have already signed up for it, so being against it isn't going to get you too far. Secondly, most Pakistanis are going to look at it as an unalloyed good um, because it's bringing money into their society and it's badly needed. So if we stood against it, it would be misunderstood. Um, but there are a lot of questions we could ask about its viability. And they said, yeah, yeah, that, we, we do that. Um, and you know, I found that over time, the Pakistanis themselves started to ask questions because they saw that uh, the jobs were not going to Pakistani laborers. It was all these Chinese laborers coming in. Um, the se secondary and tertiary contracts were being taken by Chinese companies, not Pakistani companies. There was no transparency. Uh, they didn't join the chambers of commerce of the local you know, areas where they were operating. Um, a lot of the projects seemed to go to politically important people's districts rather than necessarily on a development or economic strategy uh, design. Um, and it was connecting two very poor parts of the world in ways that there were an economic strategy. How did that turn into an engine of growth wasn't really all that apparent to me. Um, and, by the way, also uh, much of the impulse was Chinese capital looking for a place to go, and that was a place to go. That's not a problem they have today, but that was then. So it was the Pakistanis themselves who began to ask questions, and they've now got a full-time person who's trying to unwrap that and try to rationalize it, bring more transparency into it, and figure out what it is. Because the other thing is the business plan. How are you gonna, it's, it's, these aren't grants. So what's the business plan to pay it all back? And one of the things, when I was undersecretary, and I was talking, we were talking to countries all around the world about China, you know, we're saying, look, it's your decision, and we want to we want to work with China, we want to compete with China, we want to do business with China as well, but there has to be a level playing field. And if you've signed up for an agreement in the Belt and Road context, you better read the fine print, because, you know, when there's a change of government in the Maldives, from a pro-Chinese one to a pro-American one because of an election, the new government came to us and they said, you know, we did read the small print, and guess what? We just gave up the sovereignty, the previous government gave up the sovereignty of our port. How do we get it back? So, you know, we're working on that, but <laughs> so there's a motive. You've got to understand the Chinese motive. And a lot of African leaders and others would say, well, fine, David, we hear you, but what's the alternative? You're not coming in with anything. Well, we did develop, uh, it took some time, but we developed a, a, a new trade development uh, apparatus that has billions of dollars that can be tapped for private sector use, which is our way of having an alternative to, to China. But it's true. I mean, China, China, because of its ways, where it's a state-directed economy, can do things we simply are not going to do in terms of going into a small country, say an island republic in the Pacific, 50,000 people, they build a hotel and a gas station and re-tarmac their airport and their friends for life. And we, won't, we won't operate in those, those ways. Uh, but I think the people of that country may soon discover over time that there was a price that they, to pay that they didn't recognize in terms of domination. <clears throat> Like so many of the things we talked about today, time will tell. Diplomacy is hard at work, but so many questions remain. Please join me all in thanking Ambassador David Hale. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yes. We've got a couple of upcoming events here. We've got one more in-person event at the end of the year on December 15th. It's a conversation club. If you'd like to talk about this stuff, or I say or the people you live with are sick of talking about it, to come join us for a council conversation club on December 15th about digital literacy and public trust and technology. And we've got 12 programs already posted on our calendar for 2022. You can find all of this information at wacphila.org. Of course, follow us on social media, all of the platforms to share your experiences and see what we're up to next. Thank you again and have a good afternoon.